James Sharkey was telling me uh, a couple of weeks ago, I kind of hoped he would be here this morning to, so that I could uh, check the details with him, but hello James on holidays, <laughs> that there's a, there's a house in Donegal where a certain king once stayed. Uh, and the reason that that house was picked for him to stay in was that that house had within it a well, its own source of water, an internal spring. And because there, there was the threat of hostility when, when that king was here, uh, it was such a perfect location because they could guarantee uh, safe, pure water. It was a great defensive position. Imagine that they had been attacked and were under siege. You could last a long time if you've got supplies and you've got fresh water. What would you do? You would guard that well with your life. It's the source of your life. You wouldn't let it become polluted. That would only help the enemy. And so we come to Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23. Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Or as the the more recent NIV has it, for everything you do flows from it. I like the imagery uh, of the wellspring of life. Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. There are many important verses in Proverbs. There are important verses that direct our attention upwards to God. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and and lean not on your own understanding, we're told. That's directing us upward. But I think of all the verses in the book of Proverbs that direct our attention inwards. I think this is the most important If there's one verse that we should remember that directs us inward in the book of Proverbs, it's this. Because it tells us above all else, above all else, here is one verse to make your focus for life and especially for the week ahead. Here's something that the Bible says above all else, or as the ESV has it, with all diligence. Whatever you're doing, what are you going to be most diligent at? This heart keeping that is spoken of here. And there's two things I want us to see this morning. First of all, the importance of the heart and then the guarding of the heart. First of all, the importance of the heart above all else. Now, as you look at your Bibles, you'll see that in these verses there are other things mentioned. Verse 24 says speaks about our mouths. Uh, We're told, put away perversity from your mouths. Let no corrupt talk uh, come from your mouth. Verse 25, let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze. We're told later on about our feet and where they go. Think of all the damage that can come to us through the things that we look at. Whether they make us envious or jealous or discontent or angry, or proud, or lustful. Think of the damage the eyes can cause. Think of the damage our words can cause through our mouths. Think of all the trouble we can get into if we're not careful with our words. Think of all the trouble that we can get into in the places that we go where our feet take us. But Solomon says, above all that, above the eyes, the the ears, the lips, the mouth, above all else, Guard your heart. Guard your heart. Literally, the Hebrew says, more than all guarding, more than any other guarding, guard this. Whatever you're going to guard, wife, children, animals, finances, safety, this is to be guarded above all. Here's the importance of guarding the heart. Important for, let me say, two reasons, because of what it is. Because of what it is, it, it, the Bible's not thinking about the pump that circulates the blood around the body. In the Bible, the word heart doesn't refer simply to, to the physicality of the heart, nor does it re- refer to our emotional life as we would use it today. Oh, well, my heart wants this. And we're talking about our emotional life. It, it takes that in. But in the Bible, the heart takes in 
our, our, our thinking, the mind. It takes in our affections, our emotions, our desires. And it takes in our, our will, our doing, our choices, our decision making. The mind, the emotions, the will. Hold those three in your head because we'll, we'll keep coming back to them. But really what it boils down to is that's you. That's the you that's you. The real you. The Bible calls that the heart. The you that only you know. The control center. Think of all that goes through your head. And how it impacts your emotions. And how it changes how you respond to circumstances. What you decide and determine to do. That's the heart. It's fundamental to us. And the Bible tells us that it's got a problem. Jeremiah 17, 9 says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. It's sick. It's got a problem. The driver of us, the, the, the core of us is flawed and poisoned like a well that has been polluted. You see that way back in the opening book of the Bible in Genesis chapter 6 verse 5. The Lord God saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, that every inclination of the thoughts of the heart was only evil all the time. So here's our problem. The heart that is, the, the, in a sense, the real us is polluted and poisoned. And we read wonderfully from Ezekiel 36 that God is a solution to this because it's so important to us he says that this is not the way that we are to be left, but that we can come to God and we read, he says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. And I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Uh, and all of who we are in our very core of our being, our, our thought life, our emotional life, our, our will, our decision making can be transformed. There's the importance of the heart. The thing that, that governs who we are. It's broken. It's sick. But it can be restored. We'll come back to that thought in a moment. But that's what makes it so important. It, it drives us. It determines who we are. But secondly, in terms of importance of what it does, what it is, what it does. Look at our verse. It's the wellspring of of life it's the wellspring of life it's where the entirety of the you that is you bubbles out of it's the, the fountain head we might say it's the source of a spring that, that you see and you trace the river back into the little spring and then you see it beginning to percolate up out of the ground and as that little spring goes so will go the river if it becomes polluted then the river will be polluted. If our hearts be polluted, then you will be polluted. If things fester and grow in our hearts, they will appear in our lives. It may start off secret and hidden, but it soon reveals itself to the outside world. Jesus in Luke 6 says, A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. But an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. And then he says this. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Why do we say what we say? Because it comes out of our heart. In Matthew 15, 19, Jesus says, For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, False testimony, slander. The heart is important because of what it does. It's where sin starts. It's where it mutates and grows. It's where it's multiplied and cultivated. It's where it pollutes and sinks into our psyche. The heart is who we are. You know, people say things like they, they say something or they do something. They go, well, that's not who I really am. Actually, it is. 
We like to think that in our worst moments, that's the blip. Actually, our best moments are the blip. They're the odd thing. Our hearts show us the baseline. The bad moments show us the baseline of where we're actually at. Nor is it enough to say, well, okay, I hear what you're saying, Mark, but okay, what we'll do, we'll put a lid on it. We'll not let it out. But it'll leak. It'll leak. It'll, it'll pollute. It's like toxic radiation. It'll, it'll seep out into our lives. And everything we do is a reflection of, of what is inside us. So here is the importance. Our heart can take us to hell. Our heart can ruin our lives. It can ruin, if you're a Christian this morning, it can ruin your Christian witness. It can suck the life out of your Christian walk. It's important. And it's important not just for you, but think of that well that springs up. Uh, and think of waters that flow from that well and other people drinking of those waters. And our heart is like a spring of water welling up. And it, it's not just us that's impacted, but others. We shape the people around us. So we need to ask ourselves, what is springing up in our hearts that is flowing into the lives of of others picture your heart as a deep well from which you draw water from your own for your own life and you also give it to others loved ones children friends and this well it starts out and it's badly polluted but the rubbish has been cleared from the well cleaned out and what a marvelous thing it is to, to see it starting to run clear again and it's actually been cleared out at great cost. We might even say that, that, that someone loved us enough to go down into that deep well and, and pull out all the pollution and all the toxins at the cost of their own life. That's what Jesus does. So that we could have this wonderful well of pure life-giving water that bubbles up in us. Now what are we going to do? People come to drink from it. We drink from it. Will we... Will we Will we throw our rubbish into this well? Will we let an enemy poison it? Will we pour toxins in ourselves? No, above all else, we will guard that well, won't we? We will guard that well because it's a wellspring of life for us and for others. So Solomon says, my son, above all else in this book that I tell you, guard your heart for it is the wellspring of life. If you're a Christian this morning, your heart has been made new. It's been made new and that is wonderful. So guard it. Guard it. It, is, it has been cleansed. Don't let it get polluted. If you haven't yet come to Christ, put your trust in Christ. Maybe, maybe you've seen that you're struggling with your heart. Maybe you see things bubbling up inside you. Think, oh, I need to put a lid on that. Maybe there's resentment or anger or jealousy or shame or guilt or fear. And they're, they're indicators that all is not well in our hearts. And you just, you've tried to shake them and you can't shake them. But that's why we read from Ezekiel 36. What a wonderful thing. We, we know we've got a problem in the very core of us. And God says, I'll change it. I'll give you a new heart. And you can ask him. You can say, Lord, all these things, I've been trying to, to change them. But I need you to go deep down in to the well of my being and to make it new from the very source. Make it new. In Psalm 51, David says, Create in me a clean heart, O God. There's a prayer. There's a prayer, isn't it? What a prayer to pray. And you can pray that this morning. If you're looking at your heart and thinking, I've tried and I can't make it better, ask God to do it for you. So here then is the importance of the heart. That brings us secondly to consider the guarding of the heart. The guarding of the heart. Above all else, guard your heart. One writer says, I've quoted him before, Charles Bridges, all our keeping is in vain if the heart is not kept. Guard it. Guard it. He says, the heart is the citadel of man, the seat of of his dearest treasure. It is fearful to think of the many watchful and subtle assailants. I've been reading a book on Irish history. 
uh, over the last number of weeks and uh, fascinating. But you know, there's so many times and places and, and even in our holidays we we're seeing castles here and castles there uh, and they were attacked. And if you watch the Red Bull cliff diving uh, yesterday, you saw Dunluce Castle, you saw Kilbane Castle. Our land is full of castles and they're in ruins because they were attacked. Well, your heart is like that citadel. And if the enemy can capture the citadel, they take the country round about. The heart, Bridges says, is the vital part of the body. A wound here is instant death. Our hearts are under attack from that great unholy trinity, the world, the flesh, and the devil. The, the, the world around us and, and all that it's pushing at us, attacking our heart. We've got to guard our hearts. The devil wants to, to, to tempt us and to push us uh, and to, to, to pull our hearts away from God. And then ourselves. We don't even need those other enemies ourselves. We're our own worst enemies. We're like standing there pouring toxin into the well and then wondering why we've poisoned ourselves. We're to guard. We, we, we let things flourish. Resentments and jealousies and bitterness and old hurts and fears and anxieties and negative thoughts and proud thoughts. We just bucket loads of pollution. We'll pour them into our hearts. And then we stir them in. We, we ponder it all the more. And we think, you know what, I'm thirsty, I'll take a drink. And we wonder why we're worse again. We're to guard our hearts. It's under attack. But how do we do that? And I have three things that I want us uh, to take away with this morning. Know your heart, guard your heart, fill your heart. Know your heart, guard your heart, fill your heart. Know your heart. We've got to know our hearts. Again, Charles Bridges says, Nothing is more difficult, nothing is more necessary. If we do not know our weak points, Satan knows them well. Well, we need to know them. We need to know ourselves. Where are we vulnerable? Now go back to those three things that I mentioned. When the Bible talks about heart, it's taking our mind, our affections, our, our emotions, and our desire, our, our, our will, our will, our decision making. Think of those three things. Do you know where you're vulnerable in your mind? Where does your mind go to when pressure comes? D -d does it go to fear and worry? And it multiplies fear and worry and anxiety or, or doubt about God? Or where does your mind go whenever difficulties come into your life and you want comfort? Where do you go in, in your daydreams? Um, do, do we, whenever difficulties come, do we, do we look for easy re relief, perhaps in thinking about pornography, thinking about alcohol, thinking about how we can find release and relief somewhere else? Where does our mind go whenever it's free to think of it? You know, so we're not, we're not engaged in our work, we're not engaged in the things that, that demand our immediate attention, but where does our mind free wheel to? Where does our, what, what fills our mind whenever it's challenged by God's word? Does, is it excuses? Ah, but God, my circumstances are different. What, are our, what is your mind like? What is the flavor of your mind? Is it excuse making? Is it doubt filled? Is it fear driven? Is it negative? Is it self condemning? What's your mind like? Is it incessantly seeing problems and worrying about circumstances? Is it your habit to bring God into your thinking or to leave God out of your thinking? You've got to know your mind. You've got to know your affections. The things that matter to you. The things that that emotionally grab you and drive you? What emotions predominate in your heart? Do you know your own heart? You can't guard it if you don't know it. Anger, pride, jealousy, fear, self-righteousness, desire, discontentment. Do you know your heart? It's emotions. Do you fight them or do you free wheel in them? How do you feel when something that is vitally important to you 
is threatened. Um, something that you, in a sense, get your identity from. And it, it's, it's threatened. It, it may be taken away from you. It may be uh, diminished in some way. And you think, well, oh, uh, th- th- this is all of my happiness is gone. If this is, well, you know, think of Eric Little. If, if all of his emotional happiness and contentment was bound up in winning the gold medal, which actually was the case for the guy that did win the gold medal, Harold Abrahams, uh, Abraham was, ne- Abraham was never content because he always knew that Eric Little could have beaten him. His emotional satisfaction was corroded by that nagging accusation. You're not the best. You never were. No, we, can, that, we can be prone to that too in all sorts of different ways where we get our happiness, our our emotional satisfaction from the things around us rather than God. And then whenever they're threatened or whenever they they, they break down or whenever something goes wrong, we're all downcast and we're in the depths of despair and we're filled with self-pity or we're uncontrollably angry or we're fearful. Do you know your heart's affections? Do you know what your will is like? What do you do whenever the minister is saying something and you find it challenging? Do you begin to make excuses in your head? That's part of your mind, but it's also part of your will. Do you begin to dig in the heels and be stubborn? Well, that's the will at work. Do you know know, what my mum said of me? Mark would argue that a, a black horse is a white horse. A black crow is a white horse. That's part of my will. I'm pig-headed and stubborn. I need to know that. I need to know that so I can guard my heart so that whenever God's word is coming to me and I want to dig my heels in, I need to know, Mark, that's just the old you doing that. Stop it. Stop it, Mark. We're not going to grow if we do that. Our wills. What do you know your will? What, is it, what self-control do you exercise when you're at home and no one is watching? Where, where do you let your will off the hook? Ah, nobody sees. doesn't matter. I'll just do this. I'll just say this. I'll just... You know. Our decision-making. We need to know our hearts. We need to know where our hearts are vulnerable. We need to know the times and the seasons. It might be when we're under pressure. It might be when we go on holidays. It might be when things are easy. There's all sorts of different times and seasons where we know that we do not respond rightly. You've got to know your heart. And the good news is that, that in God's word, if we're willing to listen to God's word, it will show us our hearts. And the Holy Spirit will help us to see our hearts and will help us to know our hearts so that we can guard our hearts above all else. So know your heart. Secondly, guard your heart. Guard your heart. Guard your heart. How do we do that? Well, how would you guard a a well, a spring? Well, you would keep the leaves from falling down into it. You would stop dead animals from toppling into the source of your spring uh, and dying there and rotting there. You would build a cover to protect it. You would keep an eye out for the enemy seeking to come and, and to poison it. You would do all you could. You would cultivate a rigorous intolerance of pollution, wouldn't you? If you were back in the old days and you were under siege and there was the spring of, of water coming bubbling up in the middle of the castle, and you knew that it was, you would guard anybody you saw going near it. You would watch them. You know, you see somebody coming along, they, they've got a big bundle of, of horse dung, and they're about to chuck it down the well to get rid of it, you know, as they're clearing the castle courtyard. And you, you say, don't do that! Don't! We've got to drink that stuff! And yet, what do we do? Don't we allow do we allow things? Let's, let's go over those again. Our mind. How do we guard? Well, slam the door. Slam the door when thoughts begin to arise in your mind that you know are wrong. It might be temptations. It might be excuses. It might be doubts. It might be fears. It might be worries. It might be accusations against God. 
It might be anger at what God is doing in your life. No, we, we slam the door. It might be that incessant negativity that, that we indulge in and self-pity. No, get it stopped. Don't say to yourself, well, I'm not hurting anybody. It's to toxic and poisoning our hearts, our affections. Challenge emotions as they arise. Preach to them. You know, you feel pride beginning to build up. Remind yourself, God opposes the pride. I, I don't want to be in, in opposition to God. I don't want to be having God's, um, you know, laser sights targeted on me because I'm proud. No, get down, pride. Stop that. You're not so great. You're not so important. Self-pity. We love to indulge in it. Guard against it. Mock it. You know. You know, oh, here I am feeling sorry for myself and all that God has done for me and all the salvation he's going to do and all, and all eternity and here I am for these few short years that I'm here feeling sorry for myself after all he's done. What lunacy. You know, mock it in yourself. We can do that. It just depends on our, our, our nature, how it's going to, uh, what's going to be effective for us. But challenge the emotions. Envy. Envy. You might say to yourself, yeah, God hasn't given me that. I know better than God. If God was as intelligent as I am, he would have known he ought to have given me that. Really? Is that what I'm saying? You know, we challenge ourselves and we preach to him, look God, I'm not better than you. I'm not better than you. Our will. We are not victims of our feelings. We can choose to act and to believe and to behave. We can say to ourselves, come on soul. Let's give thanks to God. Psalm 103. Psalm says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and do not forget all his benefits. He, he stirs himself up. He decides that he's going to choose to obey and choose to praise. When we dis detect a stubborn streak in us, do you have one? Do you feel it rising? Say to yourself, No, no, not this time. It's not my way or the highway. It's, it's God's way. I'm going to go God's way. Guard your heart. Guard your heart. I came across a line in Charles Bridges somewhere in the book. And it said this, Watch over me, O oh my God, to preserve me from the first rising of my proud heart. Preserve me from the first rising of my proud heart. I went looking for the quote, um, and I found that he uses that phrase, the first rising, quite a number of times. Resist lust in its first rising in the heart. Squabbling, contention, restraining the first rising in ourselves, mortifying our proud tempers, anger. And do we watch diligently against the first rising in ourselves, incessantly praying for its subjugation? There's the key. Quenching these things at the first rising. Know your heart. Guard your heart. And thirdly and briefly, fill your heart. Fill your heart. I think of uh, some of those capsules you can get or, or tablets you can get that you can put into polluted water to make it drinkable again. You know, we've, we've pulled out the pollution out of this well, but, but, but still, you know, the problem is that we keep putting pollution back in and, and the waters aren't entirely drinkable. And so it's not just about taking things out and preventing things going in. We need to put the good things into our hearts to purify our hearts. So think of again those three, the mind, the affections and the will, the mind. Keep taking in God's word. Keep applying it. Don't just read it and go, well, okay, that's that read for today. Apply it. Apply it. Take it and work it into your life. I want you to think about this verse all week. Above all else, guard your heart. Now, how do I need to do that? Take it and think about that. Fill your mind with that. You might even sit down this afternoon and you could even draw out a little grid on a page and you, you, you write mind, emotions, and will across the top. And you write no, guard, and fill down the side. And you think, right, well, where... Where does my mind have problems? Where do my emotions have problems? Where, where do my choices have problems? Right, I know. Here's who I am. 
right? Here's what I need to do to guard my mind, my emotions, my will. Here's what I need to put in. Here's what I need to do to fill. This is what it takes to guard our hearts. You know, if, 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 if a king found that his well was under attack and he found a weak spot there, he found one of his soldiers was a double agent, a traitor, he would deal with him. He would identify him and he would deal with him. And we're identifying the weaknesses here, saying we will deal with this. Our mind, our affections. Thankfulness kills an awful lot of problems. Like sunlight does in water. Kills a lot of problems. How's your thankfulness? How's your thankfulness? And your will. Choose to take in God's word when you don't feel like it. Choose to to pray when you don't feel like it. Choose to be at church when you don't feel like it. My friends, don't be a Sunday on, Sunday off person if you're a Christian. You can't guard your heart if you're a Sunday on, Sunday off sort of Christian. And my friends, is there not something significant that I thought this verse was so important that I would have to preach it on a morning because there's more people here at the morning service. Are we making the most of every opportunity to guard our... We mightn't feel like being here in the evening. Guard your heart by going against our feelings by choosing with our will to be where we ought to be. Pollution doesn't ask permission. It doesn't wait till you're on guard. Choose to be filling yourselves with the resources that God gives so that your heart is guarded. And choose to do so even in the smallest things when nobody is watching. Because that develops the discipline of guarding your heart. You don't say, oh, it's only a little bit of pollution that somebody's thrown into my, my well. You say, don't do that. Come away with that. And even when nobody's watching, you don't just go and throw something down it. That would be dumb. No, we guard our hearts. So fill your heart. But most of all, fill your heart with love for Christ. Because above all else, he guarded his heart for you. He fought against the satanic assault of all the legions of hell, targeted with awful force against his mind, affections and will, his heart, like some ancient warrior fighting off the, the, the enemy as it comes to pollute the well so that his future people could drink from that well and live. He guarded his heart so that you could drink from this wellspring of life. And now that life flows from, as it were, his heart to you and bubbles up in your heart. And Solomon now says to you all the more, guard your heart. Guard your heart. Because it was one that such a great price, cleansed at such a great price. It is being made into something beautiful and through it you are refreshed by your Saviour and through it, through your heart, your Saviour brings life-giving refreshment and blessing to others. So my friends, do all it takes to guard your heart because it has been redeemed at a colossal price and brings unimagined blessings, especially you who go to camps to lead, to cook, to be at camps. In your week of camp, make sure you guard your heart so that it is a spring of life for you and for others at camp. And for all of us, let this be a verse that we meditate on and fill our minds with in this coming week. Above all else, guard your heart for it is the wellspring of life. Amen. As you're able, let us stand as we come to God in prayer.
Oh, Lord God, oh, that you would give us a better heart, a heart to love you more, a heart to hate sin more, a heart to walk more evenly with you, so that we're not up and down, humps and hollows, in the night, backwards and forwards, all over the place. Lord, give us a steadfast heart. Oh, Lord, let us know our hearts, to know the inclination of our heart, to not make excuses for ourselves, but to determine by God's enabling grace at the first rising of anything that we know that ought not to be there or the things that have been there so long that we assume that they're just part and parcel that we would would say, no, this ought not to be here. And that we, by the Holy Spirit's enabling, would guard our hearts. Oh Lord God, we thank you. We thank you that Jesus came into the world to, to cleanse our hearts and to give us a new heart. We thank you for what he has done. Father, we pray for any watching, listening here this morning or online who do not yet know Christ as their heart cleanser, that they, that they would know him as that. And they would have a new heart. And Father, Lord, for those of us who do know Christ as our Saviour, we want to guard the heart that he has given to us. Oh Lord, do not deny us such a request. Whatever else you might deny us, give us a heart that fears you, that loves you, that delights in you. Father, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.